Hi, now I'm here with Valentin Dissertin, who's a third year uh, majoring in Information Systems Technology from McGill University in Montreal, Quebec. And we're going to be talking about market segmentation. Uh, Valentin is here as part of the Global Founder Skills Accelerator Program, which brings premier student teams from around the world to work side by side with MIT students in a three month intensive program to help them learn about how to launch a new venture. Can the ability to get uh, to successfully get accurate, uh, detailed information from customers when interviewing them be taught, or is it something that people are born with or have a natural ability? I, I've never seen someone who's born with it. I think it's a, it's a really important skill that you have to acquire. And the first thing you need to understand is that there's inquiry mode versus advocacy mode. Often as an entrepreneur, we're advocating for our idea. And when we're doing primary market research, we need to inquire, we need to be in inquiry mode, not assuming the solution. We're looking for the solution at that point. So once you understand it's inquiry versus advocacy, then you're listening a lot more. And you have to have a structure as what you're going through, but you're not forcing the conversation. In some sense, you're almost like a therapist. You're pulling out what they do. And that's a skill that, that I've seen acquired. Um, I, I think I've seen people who walked in, but I know they acquired it somewhere in their life. So it's an important skill. Inquiry versus advocacy. You shouldn't be selling. You should be exploring and trying to find what, what, the, what the real data is, not what you want the data to be. Is that helpful? Yes. Okay. Um, so my second question is uh, you advocate offering a product that is aligned with the values of the team, but uh, often you have to make trade-offs between what's within your values, what's monetizable, and what is doable. So what would you say is kind of the leeway you can have? That's a really good question because sometimes I see people do something that they think can make a lot of money, but they're not passionate about it. And that doesn't work. The, the, the solution here is where all three planets are lined up, at least three planets are lined up. It's something that I'm passionate about. It's something that I, I know I can do, or I can build a team to do it. And last of all, it's something that a customer wants. So you have to find all those three planets lining up. So it has to be something that you're passionate about, you can see yourself doing for six years. It's something that there's a customer who really needs it and it's monetizable, but it's also something that's, that's possible to do. And the last one is probably the least important, but you need to do a sanity check there to make sure that's true as well. Thank you. Um, What's next from the Star Wars book? <laughs> um, so in your book, you mainly use examples of physical consumer products, uh, but are the 24 steps also applicable to websites or other digital products? Yes, so they're abso it's absolutely applicable to, to digital products and websites. The idea of segmenting markets, building a persona, figuring out the TAM is, is perfectly analogous to it. And in fact, in some ways, it's more streamlined uh, because in one sense, you know you can do it and it becomes all the more important. Whereas sometimes, I, you know, in the book I emphasize, you know, I, I don't emphasize, I use more hardware analogies because that's where I came from. But you, there's more variables involved when there's hardware. When it's a website, it's a pure kind of marketing play. So absolutely it applies to websites and I think it's very constructive. We've seen a lot of success with, in using it that way. Okay, thank you. My fourth question is that um, when you're going through market uh, differentiation and segmentation, should uh, the way you differentiate markets be influenced by what kind of product you want to build? Such as, for example, if you're building hardware, the differentiation is going to be more geographic and software may be more uh, behavioral. That's a, that's a very interesting question. The, so, first of all, when you're doing a market definition, your market should be, you know, it's the same product and it's, and it's also the same you know, sales process and cycle and all that, and the third is word of mouth. But as you're di differentiating those, the geography becomes even more important when you're doing a physical product because you have to deliver a physical product as opposed to a digital product. So with a digital product, you don't have to consideration, consider ge geography for those kind of physical reasons, but it may be cultural reasons, it may be other reasons that you do it, but your observation is correct that with a physical product, geography matters more because you have to carry inventory, you have to do all those things. That constraint is, is removed uh, when it comes to 
digital, but you have to make sure there's some word of mouth. Now in the digital world, word of mouth is often through social media or things like that. So it is correct that if it's physical, geography matters more. It doesn't mean that it doesn't matter when you get to a physical product. You just, you just have to look at it to meet those three criteria. Is, the, is it the similar product? Is it a similar sales cycle? And is there word of mouth? But word of mouth could be word of social media mouth. Thank you. So my last question is that you, um, you say that the focus should be on the end user when segmenting and always on the end user. Uh, however, when the end user is not the same as the customer, should we always keep the paying customer in mind, or should we try to push it away during the segmentation? So this is, this is a very good point. In the book, I simplify it. As Einstein once said, seek simplicity and distrust it. I focus on the end user because we want to get the person who generates the value. And then if we, if we can create value, then we know, or we have a very strong suspicion that we can monetize that in some way, shape, or form. So who's going to use it? Are they going to accept it? Are they, are they going to create value when they use it? So at Google, um, it's a two-sided market, but the, it's the end user that we need to get to generate the value. Um, and then once we get that end user, then we can use an advertising model to capture value of it. So I focus on the end user, but that's not always the case. Sometimes the end user will be driven by some other part of the value chain in a multi-sided market. In a medical market, you may have something where the end user might like it, but the person who actually makes the decision is the doctor. And so you might have to focus on the doctor to get them up to speed to prescribe, you know, it, because they're the critical gate factor. But I do simplify it, you're correct, to say that the end user is the person that to focus on. But you have to apply that with reason. But I would say about 80% of the time, it's true. Thank you.